Shabbat Shalom, everybody. Uh, we have a lot to discuss, so let's go ahead and bow our heads and pray. <clears throat> Yahweh, Kadesh is your name. We come before you with humble and eager hearts. And we ask that you guide us in your instruction, and that you bless us with your wisdom, that we may guard correctly your statutes and right rulings. We pray for your Ruach to work within us. Yahuwah, to renew our heart and our mind. And we thank our King, Yahusha HaMashiach. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain, and His blood washes us clean and makes us new again. Through His blood we are brought near to our Father again. May we call Yahusha to remembrance during the spring feast. And may we call remember to remembrance what Yahuwah did for our brethren before us in Egypt as well. <clears throat> and in Yahusha's name we pray. Amen. All right, Shabbat Shalom, everybody. Actually, I need you guys to give me just a moment. I'm having some technical difficulties here. Give me just a moment, guys. All right, Shabbat Shalom, everybody. Well, actually, Shabbat has come to a close, but welcome to Torah Truth Fellowship of Yahusha. I am your host, Brianna, and this week we are addressing Passover. I hope everybody has been doing well. It's been quite a while. Uh, I know we are still in the middle of the Enoch series, but <clears throat> we're taking a pause to address something more important, but we will pick back up on the Enoch series. I have been studying and preparing some notes to get together the next um, portion of the Enoch series, so we'll be getting back to that soon. And do bear with me. I really should have did this video last night, but as you can tell, <clears throat> I've lost my voice and it still has not completely come back yet. Uh, so we are addressing the spring feast days, Passover, unleavened bread, and first fruits. Though I think I'm going to do a separate video for first fruits, but I will discuss it briefly in this video. It's almost time for the spring feast, the Pesach, the Passover, unleavened bread, and first fruits. Are you guys ready for this? <clears throat> how do we keep Passover in the generation that we're in? Well, today we are going to talk about how, why, when, where, and the prophecy that lies beneath one of the best feast days to, <clears throat> to look forward to. <clears throat> <clears throat> we should look to this day with great anticipation, brothers and sisters, not knowing the day or hour we will be called to flee back to the promised land which is the New Jerusalem. We'll talk about meals and answer some questions that are commonly asked. And I do want to say that some of my notes for this video did come from Parable of the Vineyard, um, like for these controversial questions that are being asked. It is important that we grow and edify together, sharing wisdom and knowledge with each other. Uh, I do have my own notes added as well, so don't worry. <clears throat> we are going to be covering a lot tonight. <clears throat> the most important being how this feast day is now how we honor our Messiah, Yehusha HaMashiach. Before we begin, <clears throat> let's talk about the calendars really quickly. Give me just a moment. <clears throat> okay, so before we begin, let's talk about the calendars really quickly. There are many different calendars out there. <clears throat> uh, but, and most of the world operates on the Gregorian calendar. So, on the calendar that most people follow, the new year begins on January 1st. But, this is not Yahuwah's new year. His new year begins on the first new moon after the spring equinox. This is the first of Abib, which this year will fall on either March 21st or 22nd. It depends when the new moon is. <clears throat> so, let's begin with the history, starting in the Exodus with the first Passover. We're going to read from Exodus 12 and 13. And at this point, nine plagues had already come upon the Egyptians, and there was one left yet to come, the smiting of the firstborn, man and beast. Uh, reading Exodus 12 through 15 is a must for any Passover gathering. It is one of the greatest stories ever, and it's a wonderful way to honor Yahuwah without the leaven, the traditions of man. Tell the story with his might and his power. Uh, read with zeal when the children are involved, you know, get into it, like do voices and kind of like act out the story all over the Torah. It tells us that it is all about the children. Train up a child in the way that he should go. And when he is old, he will not depart from it. 
make this fun and exciting for them. And I actually have some links that I will provide of some books and activities that you can do with your children to make this day fun and strengthen their understanding as to why we honor this day. Now, we are only going to read chapters 12 and 13, but I am giving you guys some homework, and your homework is to read Exodus chapters 12 through 15 and become more familiar with the story that begins the first Passover. So, Exodus 12. And Yahweh spoke unto El Moshe and unto El Aaron in the land of Misraim, saying, This month shall be unto you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. Speak ye unto the assembly of Yasharel, saying, In the tenth day of this month they shall take to them every man a lamb, according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for a house. And if the household be too little for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next next unto his house take it according to the number of souls every man according to his eating shall ma- shall make your count for the lamb your lamb shall be without blemish a male of the first year you shall take it out from the sheep or from the goats and you shall keep it up until the fourteenth day of the same month and the whole multitude of the assembly of Yasharal shall kill it in the evening, and they shall take of the blood and strike it on the two side posts and the upper door post of the houses, wherein they shall eat it. And they shall eat the flesh in the night, roast with fire and matzah, eat and with bitter herbs they shall eat it. Eat not of it raw, nor sodden at all with water, but roast with fire, his head with his legs and with the pertinence thereof. And ye shall let nothing of it remain until the morning, and that which remains of it until the morning ye shall burn with fire. And And thus shall ye eat it, with your loins girded, and your shoes on your feet, and your staff in your hand, and ye shall eat it in haste. It is Yahuwah's Pesach. For I will pass through the land of Misraim this night, and will smite all the firstborn in the land of Misraim, both man and beast, and against all the Elohai of the gods of Misraim, I will execute judgment. I am Yahuwah, and the blood shall be to you for a mark upon the houses where ye are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Mitzrayim. And this day shall be unto you for a memorial, and ye shall keep it a feast to Yahuwah throughout your generations. Ye shall keep it a feast by an ordinance forever. Seven days shall ye eat matzah, even the first day ye shall put away leaven out of your houses. For whosoever eats hametz in the first day until the seventh day, that soul shall be cut off from Yasharel. And in the first day there shall be a holy assembly, and in the seventh day there shall be a holy assembly to you. No manner of work shall be done in them, save that which every man must eat, that only... That only may be done of you, and you shall guard the feast of Matzah, for in this selfsame day I have brought your armies out of the land of Mitzrayim. Therefore, you shall guard this day forever in your generation, or you shall guard this day in your generations by an ordinance forever. In the first month, on the fourteenth day of the month at even, you shall eat Matzah until the one and twentieth day of the month at even. Seven days there shall be no hametz found in your houses, for whosoever eats that which is hametz, which is bread that is leavened, that has leaven in it, even that soul shall be cut off from the assembly of Yasharel, whether he be a stranger or born in the land. Ye shall eat nothing with hametz, and all your habitations shall ye eat matzah. Then Moshe called for the elders of Yasharel and said unto them, Draw draw out and take you a lamb according to your families, and kill the Pesach, and ye shall take a bunch of hyssop, and dip it in the blood that is in the basin, and strike the lintel and the two side posts with the blood that is in the basin, and none of you shall go out at the door of your house until the morning, for Yahuwah will pass through pass through to smite the Mitzrayim. And when he sees the blood upon the lintel and on the two side posts, Yahweh will pass over the door and he will not suffer the destroyer to come into your houses and to smite you. And you shall guard this thing for an ordinance to you and your sons forever. And it shall come to pass when ye are come into the land which Yahweh will give you, according as he has promised, that ye shall guard this service. And it shall come to pass when your children shall say unto you, What mean ye by this service? That ye shall say, It is the sacrifice of Yahweh's Pesach, who passed over the houses of the children of Yasharel in Mitzrayim, when he smote the Mitzrayim and delivered our houses. And the people bowed the head and worshipped. And the children of Yasharel went away and did as Yahweh commanded Moshe and Aaron. So did they. And it came to pass that at midnight, 
Yahweh smote all the firstborn in the land of Mitzrayim, from the firstborn of Pharaoh that sat on his throne, unto the firstborn of the captive that was in the dungeon, and all the firstborn of cattle. And Pharaoh rose up in the night, he and all his servants, and all the Mitzrayim, and there was a great cry in Mitzrayim, for there was not a house <clears throat> where there was not one dead. And he called for Moshe and Aaron by night, and said, Rise up, get you forth from among my people, both ye and the children of Yasharel, and go, serve Yahuwah as ye have said, and take your flocks and your herds as ye have said and be gone and bless me also and the Mitzrayim were urgent upon the people that they might send them out of the land in haste for they said we be all dead men and the people took their dough before it was leavened their kneading troughs be bound up in their clothes upon their shoulders and the children of Yashorel did according to the word of Moshe and they borrowed of the Mitzrayim jewels of silver and jewels of gold and raiment and Yahweh gave the people favor in the sight of the Mitzrayim so that they lent unto them such things as they required and they spoiled the Mitzrayim and the children of Yashorel journeyed from Ramesses to Sukkot about 600 thousand on foot that were men so let's stop there for just a minute so just six hundred thousand of them that left out of egypt of the children of yashrael six hundred thousand of them were men of war <clears throat> that is not including the women and the children and the other people there was also egyptians that left out of egypt with the children of Yashorel as well. It was not just the, the children of Yashorel that left out of egypt there were some egyptians that also went with them <clears throat> All right. And there was about 600,000 on foot that were men, beside children, and a mixed multitude went up also with them, and flocks and herds, and very much cattle. And they baked matzah cakes, and the dough which they brought forth out of Mitzrayim. For it was not leavened, because they were thrust out of Mitzrayim, and could not tarry, neither had they prepared for themselves any victual, any food. Now the sojourning of the children of Yashorel, who dwelt in the land of Mitzrayim and in the land of Canaan, they and their fathers, was 430 years. And it came to pass at the end of 430 years, even the selfsame day, it came to pass that all the hosts of Yahuwah went out from the land of Mitzrayim. Now let's stop there again. Now, that is another interesting thing to talk about. So the children of Yashorel, their sojourning between the land of Canaan and the land of Egypt was 430 years. They spent like 200 something years in the land of Canaan and they spent a total of 230 years in the land of Egypt. And on the 430th year to the exact very day, Yahuwah delivered his people from their bondage to the same day. So, where was I? <clears throat> it is a night to be much observed unto Yahuwah for bringing them out of the land of Mitzrayim. This is the night of Yahuwah to be observed of all the children of Yashorel in their generations. And Yahuwah said unto Moshe and Aaron, This is the ordinance of the Pesach. There shall no stranger eat thereof, but every man's servant that is bought for money when you have circumcised and when you have circumcised him, then shall he eat thereof. A foreigner and a hired servant shall not eat thereof. In one house shall it be eaten. You shall not carry forth aught of the flesh abroad out of your house, neither shall ye break a bone thereof. All the assembly of Yashorel shall keep it. And when a stranger shall, shall sojourn with you, and will keep the Pesach to Yahweh, let all his males be circumcised, and then let him come near and keep it. And he shall be as one that is born in the land, for no one uncircumcised, for no uncircumcised person shall eat thereof <clears throat> one torah shall be to him that is homeborn and unto the stranger that sojourns among you thus did all the children of yashrael as yahuwah commanded moshe and aaron so did they and it came to pass in the selfsame day that yahuwah did bring the children of yashrael out of the land of mitzrayim by their armies okay now we're moving into chapter 13 and yahuwah spoke unto moshe saying sanctify me Sanctify unto me all the firstborn, who whatsoever opens the womb among the children of Yashrael, both man and of beast, it is mine. And Moshe said unto the people, Remember this day in which he came out from Mitzrayim, out of the house of bondage, for by the strength of hand of Yahuwah brought you out from this place. There shall no hamets be eaten. This day came ye out in the month of Aviv, and it shall be when Yahuwah shall bring you into the land of the Canaanim, and the Hittim, and the Emorim, and the Hivim, and the Yuvasim, which he swore unto your fathers to give you a land flowing with milk and honey, that you shall keep this service in this month. 
Seven days shall you eat, you shall eat matzah, and the seventh day shall be a feast unto Yahweh. Matzah shall be eaten seven days, and there shall be no hametz seen with you, neither shall there be leaven seen with you in all your quarters. And you shall show your son in that day, saying, This is done because of that which Yahweh did unto me when I came forth out of Mizraim. And it shall be for a sign upon your hand, and for a memorial between your eyes, that Yahweh's Torah may be in your mouth. For with a strong hand Yahweh has brought you out of Mizraim. You shall Therefore, guard this ordinance in his appointed time from year to year. And it shall be when Yahweh shall bring you into the land of the Canaanim, as he swore unto your fathers, and shall give it to you, that you shall set it apart unto Yahweh, all that open the womb, every firstling that comes of a beast which you have, the males shall be Yahweh's, and every firstling of an ass you shall redeem with a lamb. And if you will not redeem it, then you shall break his neck. And all the firstborn of man among your children shall you redeem. And it shall be when your son asks you in time to come, saying, What is this? You shall say unto him, By strength of hand Yahweh brought us out from Mitzrayim, from the house of bondage. And it came to pass, when Pharaoh would hardly let us go, that Yahweh slew all the firstborn in the land of Mitzrayim, both the firstborn of man and the firstborn of beasts. Therefore I sacrifice to Yahweh all that opens the womb, being males, but all the firstborn of my children I redeem. And it shall be for a mark upon your hand, and for frontlets between your eyes. For by strength of hand Yahweh brought us forth out of Mitzrayim. And it came to pass, when Pharaoh had let the people go, that Elohim let them not through the way of the land of the Pelishtim, although that was near. For Elohim said, lest perchance the people repent when they see war, and they return to Mitzrayim. But Elohim led the people about through the way of the wilderness of the of the Red Sea. And the children of Yasharel went up harnessed out of the land of Mitzrayim. And Moshe took the bones of Yosef with him, for he straightly sworn the children of Yasharel, saying, Elohim will surely visit you, and ye shall carry up my bones away hence with you. And they took their journey from Sukkot and encamped in Etham, in the edge of the wilderness. And Yahweh went before them by day in a pillar of a cloud to lead them to lead them the way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light. To go by day and night, he took not away the pillar of cloud by day, nor the pillar of fire by night from before the people. <clears throat> okay. The Passover in the story of the Exodus still relates today as well, and we're going to be talking about that. We are freed from sin by the blood of the Lamb, correct? And we are spiritually taken into the waters to be tested. So back then, the Hebrews were told to take lambs and slaughter them, and they were to put the blood upon their doorposts. And by doing this, the destroyer, or the angel of death, which is Satan, passed over their homes. Now, I could go really deep into this topic of the destroyer, but I will leave that for another video because it will take away from this message, which is addressing the Pesach. So the destroyer, or rather Satan, came and took all of the firstborn of Egypt, man and beast, because the Egyptians were killing all of the firstborn Hebrew boys. And let's be real here, Satan loves killing people. It's his favorite thing to do. And after the angel of death passed over, the Hebrews were taken out of Egypt into the wilderness to be tested. And many of them did not pass the test, and they were not allowed to enter into the promised land, the physical promised land. <clears throat> and similarly, we are freed by the blood of the Lamb, the Son of the Most High, <clears throat> uh, the, 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 the Son of the Most High Yahuwah, Yahusha HaMashiach, frees us. And that is a question that we need to be asking ourselves. Will you be allowed to enter the promised land, the spiritual promised land? Will you pass the testing? Because many in the first exodus did not. They were tested, and they were mostly tested by food and by water, and they lacked faith in Yahuwah to provide for them. Now, let's think about that for a moment. Yahuwah created us. He made us. So don't you think that he knows we need food and water? He is not ignorant to our needs. He, would, he was not going to let them starve and thirst to death in the wilderness, but he was testing them to see how faithful they were. And they they didn't have any faith in him to provide for them, and it angered him. And that is one of the reasons why they were not allowed to enter the promised land. That was just one. There was a few. So, anyways, they spoke against Yahuwah, and then they conspired against Moses and Aaron. And then let us not forget the golden calf incident as well. And because of all of these things, their disobedience and their huge lack of faith, they wandered in the desert for 40 years until they all died.
Only their children were allowed to enter into the promised land. This entire week of feasting and worship festivities is all about being delivered from the bondage of sin and to be gathered by Yahweh from our slavery and journey once more to the spiritual promised land, which is New Jerusalem, all while witnessing many miracles. Obviously, this is yet to be fulfilled. This is what we are waiting for. We are waiting for the day when we are exodus once more. This one is greater than the last. And we will get to that in a bit. Now we are going to read uh, Hebrews 3.16 through four, chapter 4, line 2, and also line 11. <clears throat> For some, when they heard, did provoke. Howbeit, not all that came out of Mitzrayim by Moshe, but with whom was he grieved forty years? Was it not them that had sinned, whose carcasses fell in the wilderness? And to whom swore he that they should not enter into his rest? But to them that believed not, they didn't believe in him. So we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. Now we are on to chapter 4. Let us therefore fear, lest a promise of being left, lest, lest a promise being left us entering into his rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. For unto us was the besora, the gospel, the good news preached, as well as unto them. The gospel is nothing new. The New Testament, the gospel, that is nothing new. The gospel has been being preached for a long time. Repent. That is the whole heart of the gospel is to repent. And that's the whole heart of the entire Bible is to repent as well. Okay. So for unto that, unto us was the Besorah preached as well as unto them. But the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. They didn't believe it. Let us labor, therefore, to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. Okay, so let's jump back to chapter 12 of Exodus, and let's read line 2 again. Exodus 12, 2. This month shall be unto you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. So the beginning of the year. So most people are used to the Gregorian calendar. is the calendar that the majority of the world uses. And on this day, uh, and on this calendar, the new year begins on January 1st, which is actually a pagan day named after the false god Janus. That's a different topic, though. And this uh, this calendar is solely based off of the sun. Uh, Yahweh's calendar is a loony solar calendar. It is based off of the sun and the moon. Um, so the first day of Yahweh's new year begins in the spring when everything is new again. Makes sense to me. On Yahweh's calendar, the months are based off of the sliver of the new moon. And I will show you guys a picture of what that looks like in just a minute. So a new moon, according to Yahweh, is the first sliver of moon you see again after the moon disappears. So to track the first of Abib, which is the first month on Yahweh's calendar, we look for the sliver of the new moon that comes after the spring equinox, which this year will fall either on the evening of March 21st or 22nd. And then from there, we count 14 days to reach Passover, which depending on the moon will fall either on the evening of April 5th or April 6th. So let me show you what the sliver of the new moon looks like really quickly. Oh. Oh. Bless me. Excuse me, guys. I'm sorry. I, it has to be this weather that is doing this to me. Last week, it was like in the 80s, and this week, it has been cold. Okay, so here's a good picture of the sliver. Let me turn this around for you guys. So, when you see the sliver in the sky like that, that first little sliver of moon. Let me go back. See, the first little sliver of moon that you see, that... That is what is considered Yahweh's new moon. <clears throat> so let's talk about the moon for a moment. We're going to read Enoch 74, 13. The moon brings on all the years exactly, that their stations may come neither two forwards nor two backwards in a single day, but that the years may be changed with correct precision in 364 days. And 
In three years, the days are 1,092. In five years, they are 1,820. And in eight years, 2,912 days. Hold on, guys. Okay. So we see here in Enoch, the moon brings on the years. Um, it is how we deem Yahweh's new year, which is what we are waiting on right now. The sign of the first of Abib, which comes upon the sighting of the new moon. Now I'm going to read this next one and I'm going to talk over, I'm going to talk it over as we read. Uh, Enoch explains the phases of the moon. And we see that according to Yahweh, after the moon disappears, the first sliver of light that we see is the new moon and it brings in the new month. And the Hebrew word for month actually derives from the Hebrew word for moon. All right, so we're going to read Enoch chapter 78. The names of the sun are these, one Areas and the other Tomas. The moon has four names. The first is Osanya, the second Ebla, the third Benes, and the fourth Are. These are the two great luminaries, whose orbs are as the orbs of heaven, and the dimensions of both are equal. In the orb of the sun are seven parts of light, which are added to it more than the moon. By measure, it is put in until the seventh portion of the sun is departed. They set, in, they set, enter into the western gate, circuit by the north, through the eastern gate, go forth over the face of heaven. When the moon rises, it appears in heaven, and half of a seventh portion of its light is all in it. So, we know that the moon gets its light from the sun correct? So the, the sun gives the moon its light in portions. So right here, it's talking about there is a seventh of a portion of the moon lit. There's 14 portions to the moon. So if there's a seventh of a portion lit, we got a half moon. Um, so where was I? In 14, the whole of its light is completed. Three quintuples light is put into it until 15 until 15 is light is completed according to the signs of the year and we also know that sometimes uh, the month also has the moon cycle also has 29 and sometimes even 30 days but usually it's 28 or 29 uh, so that's where this 15th part comes in uh, the moon has the half of a seventh portion during its diminution, on the first day, its light decreases a 14th part, on the second day, a 13th part, on the third day, a 12th part, and so on and so forth. Um, and on the 14th day, it decreases half of its seventh part, and on the 15th day, the whole remainder of its light is consumed. There's no moon. On stated months, the moon has 29 days. It also has a period of 28 days. Uriel likewise showed me another regulation. When light is poured into the moon, how it is poured into it from the sun. All the time that the moon is in progress with its light, it is poured in the presence of the sun until its light is in 14 days completed in heaven. And when it is wholly extinguished, its light is consumed in heaven. And on the first day, it is and on the first day, it is called the new moon, for on that day, light is received into it. It becomes precisely completed on the day that the sun descends into the west, while the moon ascends at night from the east. The moon then shines all the night until the sun rises before it, when the moon disappears in turn before the sun. Uh, where light comes to the moon, there again it decreases until all its light is extinguished and the days of the moon pass away. Then its orb remains solitary without light. During three months, it affects it affects 30 days its period, and during three months, it affects in 29 days each, which it affects its decrease in its first period and in the first gate, in 177 days. And at the time of its going forth, during three months, it appears 30 days each, and during three months, it appears 29 days each. In the night, it appears for in the night it appears for each twenty as a man, and in the day as heaven, for it is nothing for it is nothing else except its light. And then we are also going to read uh, Sirach 43, 6 through 8. He made the moon also to serve in her season for a declaration of times and a sign of the world. From the moon is the sign of feasts, a light that decreases in her perfection. The month 
is called after her name, increasing wonderfully in her changing, being an instrument of the armies above, shining in the expanse of heaven. And now before we move forward really quickly, I want to show you in scripture what Yahweh wants us to do on new moons, how he wants us to bring in the beginning of a new month. And it is found in the book of Numbers. Numbers 10.10 10. Also in the day of your gladness and in your solemn days and in the beginning of your months, ye shall blow the trumpets or the shofars over your ascending smoke offerings and over the sacrifices of your peace offerings that they may be to you for a memorial before your Elohim. I am Yahweh Elohim. And Numbers 28.11. And in the beginning of your months, you shall offer an ascending smoke offering unto Yahweh, two young bullocks and one ram, seven lambs of the first year without spot. And now, like I said before, we do not do sacrifices anymore. Uh, Messiah fulfilled that. We'll talk about that shortly. Now we offer up our bodies. We are living sacrifices. We deny ourselves to the flesh. And we also offer up the sacrifice, uh, the fruit of our lips, which is praise. So now let's talk about line 13. Exodus 12, 13. And the blood shall be to you for a mark upon the houses where ye are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Mitzrayim. A foreshadow of Yahusha's blood. Though nowadays, like I just said, we don't perform sacrifices anymore, but we can still partake in this uh, marking of the doorpost by using water. As scripture tells us that the three are in agreement, the blood, the Ruach HaKadosh, and the water. 1 John 5, 8. And there are three that bear witness in earth, the Ruach, the water, and the blood, and these three agree in one. So it is also symbolic of having the blood of Messiah rest on the door of your heart as well, as scripture also says that we are the temple of Yahuwah now, and we will talk about leaven in just a little bit. But I want you to keep in mind that a lot of the hype around leaven comes from Jewish tradition and not scripture. So just keep that in mind because we are going to be sticking to what the scripture says. <clears throat> Uh, Exodus twelve twenty two, And ye shall take a bunch of hyssop and dip it in the blood that is in the basin and strike the lintel and the two side posts with the blood that is in the basin and none of you shall go out the door of his house until morning. So a lot of people actually miss out on fellowship during the Passover because of this first. But it does seem that this was just relevant to the first Passover due to the angel of death riding over Egypt. Um, because we see later in Messiah's time, everybody travels from wherever they are to Jerusalem for all of the set apart feast days. And then we also see in uh, Second Chronicles and Second Kings, uh, these righteous kings like Josiah and Hezekiah hold these feasts and we see people leave their homes to come out and celebrate the feast. Now I want to talk about something in Exodus chapter 13. We're going to read line 9. Exodus 13, 9. And it shall be for a sign upon your hand and for a memorial between your eyes that Yahweh's Torah may be in your mouth. For with a strong hand has Yahweh brought you out of Misraim. A sign in your hand and in your forehead. Does that ring a bell at all? So the mark of the beast. The beast has his mark and Yahweh as well has his mark. When you keep the Sabbath and when you keep the feast days, it is a mark upon you that you are guarding Yahweh's Torah and he marks you and he puts his Torah in your mouth that you may speak it. And he also writes it upon your heart. Remember, Messiah said what proceeds out of the mouth comes from the heart. <clears throat> A man who speaks it ought also to live in it, as Abraham also once said. So if you're new to this, I totally understand how overwhelming this can all be, especially if it is your first time. And I do want to say that I'm still a baby in my walk as well. This is the second Passover that I will be honoring. And in the last year, I have grown and I have learned a lot in my walk. I have gained a lot of wisdom and I have put away pretty much all tradition. I mean, there's still some things I'm trying to purge out. And it's okay if you don't get it all right the first time. I didn't. It's how we grow and how we learn. The more we desire to please Yahweh, the more he shows and reveals to us. If you are interested in learning more about the commandments and prophecy and all of that, I suggest checking out the playlist that I have that's called Yah for Beginners, and I will actually leave a link for it in the description. Um, and if you're listening to this and you're thinking, you know, well, I'm a Gentile. These things sound fun and all, but I'm not a Jew. Listen, 
If you believe in Yahusha and you guard the commandments, guess what? You are part of Israel and those promises also belong to you. We are grafted back into the covenant, whether stranger or native born through the blood of Messiah Yahusha. <clears throat> Exodus 12, line 49 says, There is one Torah, one Torah for stranger and for native born. And Galatians uh, 3, 26 through 29, For ye are all the children of Elohim by faith in Mashiach, Yahusha. For as many of you as been baptized into Mashiach and have put on Mashiach, there is neither Yahudi, neither nor Yavani. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. For ye are all one in Yahusha HaMashiach. And if you belong to Mashiach, then ye are Avraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. So, why do we still celebrate Passover today? Well, if you have wound up here, I am hoping that it is because you realize that we are not called to celebrate the holidays of the world, like Easter and Christmas. And if you aren't aware, I highly suggest checking out my series that is called Worldly Traditions. Uh, this is also found in my uh, Yah for Beginners playlist, Deuteronomy 12, 30-31. Take heed to yourself that ye be not snared by following them, talking about the heathen nations, after that they be destroyed from before you, and that you inquire not after their Elohim, saying, How did these nations serve their Elohim? Even so, I will do likewise. You shall not do so unto Yahweh Elohika, for every abomination to Yahweh, which he hates, have they done unto their Elohim, for even their sons and their daughters they have burnt in the fire to their Elohim. This is what Yahweh says about worshiping him the way that you want to worship him or the way that other nations have worshiped him or their own gods. Some also argue that we cannot keep Passover today uh, due to this other command. Deuteronomy 16, 5 through 6. You may not sacrifice the Pesach within any of your gates, <clears throat> which Yahweh Elohika gives you, but at the place which Yahweh Elohika shall choose to place his name in, there you shall sacrifice the Pesach at evening, at the going down of the sun, at the season that you came forth out of Mizraim. So, in other words, this is saying that you can't do this anywhere other than Jerusalem. But once again, sacrifice is done away with. We don't perform sacrifices anymore. Yahusha was the final Passover sacrifice, so we don't have to worry about slaughtering a lamb anymore. Though I do want to say, you know, you are allowed to slaughter your lamb. It is not a sacrifice just by killing a lamb that you are going to kill and eat. When they performed sacrifices, there was an entire ceremony that went along with performing the sacrifice that the priests would do. So there is a difference between slaughtering an animal that you have raised to eat it and performing a sacrifice. But we do not have to do this. You can just go to the grocery store and buy some lamb. That is also fine. <clears throat> So this command was also given to the people who inherited the physical promised land, but then they lost it due to their disobedience, so they were dispersed. <coughs> <clears throat> we have all been dispersed, and we are back in Egypt, a spiritual Egypt. I can also agree that the command given in Exodus to keep this feast forever throughout your generations trumps this command, especially as we establish there's no more sacrifice. And also, almost immediately after this, Joshua and the Israelites held their Passover in Gilgal which is near Jericho and not Jerusalem. So Moses gave the command, and then about 40 days later, Joshua held the Pesach in Gilgal. Joshua 5.10, And the children of Yashorel encamped in Gilgal and kept the Pesach on the 14th day of the month at evening in the plains of Jericho. So did Joshua completely ignore Moses, or did Joshua know that this commandment was for once they were in the land? Keep in mind, the real reason Yahweh wanted them to come to Jerusalem year after year was because at the time that was where he dwelt. His presence was in inside of the temple. But we know that the prophets told us that it wouldn't always be this way. And Yahushua told us this as well. <clears throat> Acts seven forty eight through fifty. Howbeit El Elyon dwells not in temples made with hands, as said the prophet, Heaven is my throne, and earth is my footstool. What house will ye build me, says Yahuwah, or what is the place of my rest? Has not my hand made all these things? 
Stephen was quoting Isaiah chapter 66. Let's take a look at it. Isaiah 66, 1 through 2. Thus says Yahweh, the heavens are my throne, and the earth is my footstool. Where is the house that ye build unto me? And where is the place of my rest? For all those things has my hand made, and all those things have been, says Yahweh. But to this man will I look, even to him that is poor and of a contrite ruach that trembles at my word. And Yahusha said in Matthew eighteen twenty, for where one or two for where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I in the midst of them. And lastly, first Corinthians three sixteen. Know ye not that ye are the temple of Elohim, and that the Ruach Elohim dwells in you? The Ruach HaKadosh dwells within us. We are now the temple of Yahweh, not graven with human hands, but by the hands of Yahweh, and not bought with silver or gold, but by the blood of Yahusha. And we are no longer looking to be reunited in physical Jerusalem, but to be gathered to the new Jerusalem, which is spiritual. Therefore, we should be honoring Passover the same way our ancient Hebrew ancestors did when they were in captivity in Egypt, awaiting their deliverance. Let's have a look at something Yahushua said in the book of John. John 4, 20 through 24. Our fathers worshipped in this mountain, and ye say that in Yerushalim is the place where men ought to worship? Yahushua said unto her, Woman, believe me, the hour comes when ye shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Yerushalim worship the Father. Ye worship, ye worship, ye know not what. <clears throat> ye know not what. We know what we worship, for Yeshua, salvation, is of the Yahudim. But the hour comes, and now is, when the true worshiper shall worship the Father in Ruach and in truth. For the Father seeks such to worship him. Elohim is that Ruach. He is that spirit. And they that worship him must worship him in Ruach and in truth. The woman says to Yahushua, our fathers worshipped in this mountain, and she's talking about the high places of Sumeria. And Yahushua says to her, Woman, believe me when I tell you that no one's going to be worshipping in this mountain or coming down to Jerusalem anymore. The hour comes when the true worshippers will worship Yahweh in spirit and in truth, because Yahweh is spiritual. Therefore, we must worship him in his spirit and in his truth. So how do we keep the feast today? Well, let's get into it. Before we dive into details... Though we must be vigilant and use our discernment when it comes to traditions. A lot of us set apart believers in Yahusha have washed off the ways of the world, the traditions, the holidays, and we've been getting back to the biblical days. But in turn, that has also caused a lot of people to jump from one, one extreme, which is Christianity, to another extreme, which is Judaism. And there are even more man made traditions in modern day Judaism than there are in Christianity. The traditions of the Pharisees, which I remind you, Yahushua hated. Those same traditions are still practiced to this very day. And imagine how many more traditions have been added over the last more than 2,000 years. Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. And really quick, I want to show you guys the definition of rabbinic Judaism. Let's take a look at it. Let's have a look. All right, let me flip the camera around. All right, rabbinic Judaism, also called rabbinism, rabbinicism, or Judaism espoused by the rabbinites, has been the mainstream form of Judaism since the 6th century CE after the codification of the Babylonian Talmud. Rabbinic Judaism has its roots in Pharisaic Judaism. They are the children of the Pharisees. And let me say, there's a lot of ways that you can be a modern day Pharisee. So when I say that they are the children of the Pharisees, know that I mean that they are the children of the literal Pharisees. The literal Pharisees that Yahushua rebuked in his day. Those are their children that are in that country, in that land to this day. <clears throat> And they hold, and make no mistake too, they also hold the Talmud in the book that says that our Messiah is in Sheol right now, burning in boiling feces. Yeah, that is what they think about him. So those people are not his people. <clears throat> so beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. 
So let's talk about some of the man-made traditions, and this is probably where it's going to start ruffling some feathers. Like the Seder plate, that is not found in scripture, but it is a huge Jewish tradition. They don't eat the lamb. Let that marinate for a moment. They do not eat the lamb. They put a lamb bone on a plate and they stare at it all night, but they do not eat one part of the lamb. Who does the lamb represent? It represents our Messiah. And make no mistake, they know that, brothers and sisters. They're not ignorant. They knew exactly who Yahushua was. They just didn't want to accept it. It is our Messiah, and they do not partake of it. And then they command that you fill four cups of wine and fill a fifth cup for Elijah the prophet, whose coming was already fulfilled by John the Baptist. And the ophikamen, which is a piece of matzah wrapped in a cloth that is hidden during the meal for one of the children to find later for a treat. None of this is found within the Torah, and that was what I forgot to mention about the Talmud. They elevate the Talmud above the the Torah. In rabbinic Judaism, you're not even allowed to read the Torah until you learn the Talmud first, because they want you to see it through their eyes. Uh, So yeah, none of this stuff is found within the Torah, and it should be thrown out the window immediately. They are found in the Talmud and all the man-made added laws. Drinking wine is not prohibited by the Torah, but for some people, three cups of wine makes them drunk, and it's not good for us to be getting drunk, especially on a set-apart feast day. That is not the time to be getting drunk. Some of these man-made traditions can be fun, and I understand that. I, you know, I used to feel that way when I first you know, started learning about the Uh, pagan holidays and stuff. But I realized that it was my emotions that were attached to these things and not actually myself. And it's time that we just all learn the lesson, like what happened with the golden calf incident, and we just do things his way, the way that he asked us to do them. Because at the end of the day, it is all about celebrating him. And it's all about him. And it's not about us. Matthew fifteen seven through 9 Ye hypocrites, well did Yeshayahu, Isaiah, prophesy of you, saying, This people draws nigh unto me with their mouth, and honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. But in vain they do worship me, teaching for, the, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. Okay, so now let's talk about the food a little bit. What kind of food do we eat? Since none of us desire to worship our Father in vain, we are going to be sticking to the food that the Bible tells us to eat. Exodus 12, 8. And ye sh- they shall eat the flesh in that night, roast with fire and matzah, and with bitter herbs they shall eat it. And we'll touch more on that in just a second. Let's talk about the timing of the Passover real quick. How long does the feast last? How do we understand the days? And let's start with the commandment that's given in Leviticus. <clears throat> These are the feasts of Yahuwah, even holy assemblies, which ye shall proclaim in their appointed times. And the fourteenth day of the first month at even is Yahuwah's Pesach. And on the fifteenth day of the same month is the feast of Matzah unto Yahuwah. Seven days ye must eat Matzah. And on the first day ye shall have a holy assembly. Ye shall do no servile work there, but ye shall offer offerings made by fire unto Yahuwah seven days. And the seventh day is a holy assembly. Ye shall do no servile work there. Like I stated earlier, we don't perform sacrifices. Sacrifices now is the fruit of our lips, which is praise. Praise Yahuwah every day of those seven days. Passover begins at the evening of the 14th day of the first month, which is April 5th. We're just going to go with April 5th on the Gregorian calendar. And it extends to the night of the 15th day, which Yahuwah's days are different from man's days. On the Hebrew calendar, a new day begins at nightfall after the sun has gone down. So as the sun sets on the 14th, this is when you begin your meal and you eat into the night after the sun has gone down. Once the sun has gone completely down and the night takes over, it is now the 15th day. The Passover lamb must be cooked by the 14th at sundown and eaten into the night of the 15th. But the feast also begins the week, this feast also begins the week of unleavened bread. Now I would like to provide some scriptures showing us that the feast is seven literal days and not eight as Judaism has espoused to this feast. Uh, The eighth day was added by rabbinic Jews and it is still commemorated to this day. 
Ezekiel 45, 21. In the first month, in the fourteenth day of the month, ye shall have the Pesach, a feast of seven days. Matzah shall be eaten. In Second Chronicles 30, 21. And the children of Yasharel that were present in Jerusalem kept the feast of Matzah, seven days with great gladness. And the Levayim and the priests praised Yahuwah day by day, singing with loud instruments unto Yahuwah. So there is quite a few more that you can find as well, showing that this feast lasted seven days exactly. Prior to the Passover meal, we are to throw away all leaven and like sourdough starters. You can buy more once the seven days is over. And I will link a short video in the description of what is what is and isn't real leaven. It's about 10 minutes. Um, it's basically talking about like sourdough starters and like things of that nature. Oh no, I'm having the technical difficulties again. Give me just a moment. Okay, so it's basically talking about um, like sourdough starters and like things of that nature. Um, this does not apply to things with baking soda, like your crackers, your cookies. Um, although Judaism goes to the extreme and throws them all away, um, it doesn't even apply to all things containing yeast either. Because what do we drink on the night of the Passover? Wine. And what does wine contain? Yeast. All wine contains yeast. It is fermented with the grapes. So if we refrain from everything containing yeast, wouldn't this include wine? <clears throat> Messiah drank wine the night that he honored his very last Passover, his last night on earth. He took the glass of wine and drank it. And he said, drink the wine that it is his blood and that he would cover our sins with, that he would cover our sins with. And he said, it was the blood of the renewed covenant. And he said, do this in remembrance of me. So we can see that this is strictly about bread. Interestingly, leaven is also a term for teaching. Oh, excuse me. Hiccups. <clears throat> excuse me. I'm sorry. <clears throat> Um, remember, Yahushua told, uh, told the disciples to beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. Leading up to and during the Feast of Unleavened Bread is the best time to be ridding ourselves of leaven doctrine that we have been taught in our youth to make our ways align with his ways. So next time you think that I'm just being really harsh about these traditions, both Jewish and Christian alike, this is why. That is leaven, doctrine that has been added to and taken away from. Leaven also represents sin. We should also be ridding ourselves of sin in the weeks leading up to the feast. Once again, let's address the calendar really quickly. Because it is one of the most debated topics within the community. Everyone thinks that they have the right calendar. And I have brothers and sisters who are on different calendars than me. And, you know, I haven't really got this whole thing worked out yet. I'm still trying to learn the creator's calendar. Um <clears throat> And we've all, you know, asked and prayed for Yahweh to teach us his calendar. So how do we all end up on different calendars? Who has it right? All of us hope and pray that we are doing things correctly as Yahweh has asked us to do them. But what if this happens for the purpose of testing? Are we showing love and patience to one another as we all grow? Are we being meek with one another? Or are we being kind of prideful? You know, your calendar is wrong and you're doing it all wrong. And that's the doctrine of demons. Like, y'all, I cannot tell you how often I have seen comments like that, like right off of the bat. No gentle correction, no loving kindness, just rude and insulting to start the conversation. And like as much as I would like to jump in and say something, I usually tend to stay away from those kind of engagements um, because nothing productive ever comes from having that kind of attitude. Uh, when we correct our brothers and sisters, we must be patient with them as Yahuwah is patient with us. Do to remember that you once were where they are. Don't treat them like they're stupid or something. We correct with love. We correct with our hearts, brothers and sisters, not our minds. What the mouth speaks proceeds from the heart. Even if we don't agree, even if we know the person is dead wrong, you still correct them in a way that does not make them hate what you are telling them. And let's be real for a second, though. What do you think that Yahweh is going to judge more heavily? The way that you treat people <clears throat> or if you have the correct calendar? 
you know, you're you're kind of rude, but uh, you have the right calendar, so I guess I, you can get in. <laughs> what do you think is a weightier matter? Like, let's just be real for a minute. I mean, the calendar matters to an extent, but what do you think here is the weightier matter? The way that you're acting towards people who are on the same calendar as you, or if you have the correct calendar. Hebrews twelve fourteen. Follow peace with all men and holiness, without which no man shall see Yahweh. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm sorry, guys. So with that being said, the way that I understand it, I will be celebrating Passover on the evening of April 5th. And that is assuming that the new moon is on the 21st of March, which will mark the first day of Yahweh's new year, the first of Abib, putting the 14th day on April 5th. And it will continue on to April 12th at evening. April 6th, which begins during the night of the Passover meal, begins unleavened bread. And April 7th is the day of the first fruits, when the first fruits of the harvest were usually offered. But Messiah Yahusha was the first fruits raised from the dead. The day of the first fruits, the third day, he rose. Now, well, actually, I do think I'm going to make a separate video about the day of the first fruits. And the day of the first fruits is not a Sabbath day. All right, so let's get back to the meal. We're going to be sticking to the scriptures, like I said previously. <clears throat> so let's expound a little bit. I'm so sorry for my voice, guys. I'm sure I sound terrible. I probably sound like a dying horse or something. Oh, I can I can only hear in my head, and it sounds terrible to me. I can only imagine what it sounds like for y'all. <laughs> I'm sorry. <clears throat> So now the meals after the Passover during unleavened bread, you can be creative, just no leavened bread. Now let's look at the word for the Passover meal, Exodus 12, eight through 11, and they shall eat the flesh in that night, roast with fire and matzah and with bitter herbs, they shall eat it. Eat not of it raw, nor sodden at all with water, but roast with fire, his head with his legs, and with the pertinence thereof. And ye shall let nothing of it remain until the morning, and that which remains of it until the morning ye shall burn with fire. And thus shall ye eat it, with your loins girded, and with your shoes on your feet, and your staff in your hand, and ye shall eat it in haste. It is Yahweh's Pesach. So, lamb, unleavened bread, and bitter herbs. That's it. So some of you out there may be vegetarian or vegan, but I do want you to consider this, that it is a commandment in the Torah. Even if it's just, you know, one or two bites, can't you do that just in honor of him? Some say that Yahusha is our sacrifice and he fulfilled the role of the lamb. But couldn't we say he fulfilled all of the commandments and he fulfilled all of the parts of Passover? I mean, he's our unleavened bread, our bread of life. Uh, that free free of man's doctrines. So do we just not eat unleavened bread for a week? Uh, <clears throat> just bear that in mind and consider what I have said. Every brother and sister needs to reach conviction on their own for their own reason, not because someone told them so. When it comes to getting our lamb, we must also be careful about. Give me a moment, guys. I'm sorry. I gotta clear my throat. Okay, sorry. Um. When it comes to getting our lamb, we also must be careful about this. We should care about where our lamb came from. Was it abused? Was it killed humanely? Was the blood drained from it? That's important, <clears throat> which is a biblical precept. Is it halal? Which halal is a slaughter practice that is scriptural and they drain the blood, which is good. We want the blood to be drained as we are commanded against eating blood. The life is within the blood. And I recommend doing your own research about local shops that have meat that is halal. Revelation 2, 14. But I have few things against you because you have there them that hold the doctrine of Bilam, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Yashorel, to eat things sacrificed unto idols and to commit fornication. Halal meat is found primarily, mostly in the Middle East, and it is flooding our country with the rise of local Middle Eastern mom and pop shops. Um, now, there have been some accounts from those who work in some of the slaughterhouses attesting that the animals are sacrificed in the name of Allah, <clears throat> a false god. 
So just do your own research before you buy. In retrospect, some larger meat processing plants slaughter inhumanely by strangling the animal. We are forbidden from eating things that have been strangled also. <clears throat> Um, or some of them are also electrocuted. Acts 15.20, but we write unto them that they abstain from pollutions of idols and from fornication and from things strangled and from blood. Roast the lamb with fire, bitter herbs, um, and I'm going to give you, I'm going to give a homemade matzo recipe in the description below. Some people say that you have to eat unleavened bread the entire week and you can't eat anything else, but is that scriptural? Second Chronicles uh, two, Second Chronicles thirty twenty one through twenty two, and the children of Yasharel that were present at Yerushalayim kept the feast of Matzah seven days with great gladness, and the Levi'im and the priests praised Yahweh day by day, singing with loud instruments unto Yahweh, and Yitzik Yahu. Ezekiel spoke comfortably unto all the Levi'im and taught the good knowledge of Yahuwah, and they did eat throughout the feast seven days, offering peace offerings and making confession to Yahuwah Elohim of their fathers. <clears throat> now let's talk about bitter herbs. Bitter herbs come in many varieties, uh, lettuce, parsley, dandelion leaves, cilantro, I mean, it goes, the list can go on. If you do eat something wild grown, though, please do be safe and check to make sure that it is something safe to consume. Um, and also wine. Wine isn't commanded, but it is consumed during the feast. Uh, Jasher 80, 48 through 49. And all the families of Mitzrayim wept upon that night, each man for his son and each man for his daughter being the firstborn. And the tumult of Mitzrayim was heard at a distance on that night. And Bathia, the daughter of Pharaoh, went forth with the king on that night to seek Moshe and Aaron in their houses and found them in their houses eating and drinking and rejoicing with all the Asherel. So, and for those who are not aware, the book of Jasher is mentioned in uh, Joshua 10.13 and 2 Samuel 1.18. Also, let us take this into account as well. <clears throat> Uh, Matthew 26, 27 through 29. And he took the cup and he gave thanks and he gave, gave it to them saying, drink ye all of it. For this is my blood of the renewed covenant, which is shed for many uh, for the remission of sins. But I say unto you, I will not drink henceforth of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it anew with you in my father's kingdom. Yahusha didn't hate or reject wine. His first miracle was literally turning water into wine. Also, we must think about the fact that the grape harvest was six months prior to the Passover, and the only way to preserve grape juice in those days was to ferment it, which creates wine. Now, you don't have to drink alcohol. I totally understand if you abstain from alcohol, but it, you know, at least drink like some sparkling grape juice or even just regular grape juice. So now let's talk about eating in haste or anticipation. Exodus 12, 11, And thus shall ye eat it, with your loins girded, and your shoes on your feet, and your staff in your hand, and ye shall eat it in haste. It is Yahuwah's Pesach. And let's talk about the prophetic side of Yahuwah's Pesach. Uh, while Yahusha fulfilled these three spring feasts, he was crucified on Passover, he was entombed on, on, on uh, unleavened bread, and then he rose on first fruits, there is still future fulfillment to come. Uh, removed from the Masoretic text, and if you don't know what that is, it is the text that you know the KJV and the NIV and the Sefer and many, many, many other popular versions of the Bible are based off of. But when we look to the Greek Septuagint, which is roughly 1,100 years older than the Masoretic text, and I also want to say, too, if you look it up and read about it, the Masoretic text was actually written by the Pharisees while they were in Babylonian captivity. So it was written roughly around the time of the Talmud. Okay, so but uh, when we look at the Septuagint, we can see a different prophecy being spoken about the regathering. Um, what, uh, what I have referred to in the past as the second exodus. And only the Septuagint tells us about the timing of this prophecy. And it's hidden within Jeremiah 38.8 or Jeremiah 31.8 in the Masoretic text. And the chapters um, are a little different between the Masoretic and the Septuagint because uh, the Septuagint didn't leave stuff out. 
So the chapters are a little bit longer. So let's go ahead and compare the two. Uh, we're going to read the Masoretic first. We're going to read Jeremiah 31, 8. It says, Behold, I will bring them forth from the north country and gather them from the coasts of the earth, and I will and with them the blind and the lame, the woman with child, and her that travails with child together, a great company shall return thither. Now we're going to read the Septuagint, and it's found in Jeremiah 38, 8. It says, Behold, I bring them from the north, and will gather them from the end of the earth to the feast of Passover, and the people shall beget a great multitude, and they shall return hither. I mean, is that not amazing? If that does not speak to the future fulfillment that the Passover holds, then I don't know what does. So therefore, let us eat in haste with our loins girded and ready for the day that the great that the bleh, ready for the day greater than the first comes. The day when we begin our journey to what has been promised. Jeremiah 23, 7 through 8. Let's talk about the second Exodus. Here it is. Jeremiah 23, 7 through 8. Therefore, behold, the days come, says Yahweh, that they shall no more say, Yahweh lives, which brought up the children of Yashrael out of the land of Mitzrayim. But Yahweh lives, which brought up and which led the seed of the house of Yashrael out of the north country and from all the countries whither I have driven them, and they shall dwell in their own land. So, the week of unleavened bread has two Sabbaths, the first and the seventh day at evening. The evening of April 5th and uh, to the evening of April 6th is a Sabbath. And then likewise, the evening of April 11th to the evening of April 12th is a Sabbath. So, just like the weekly Sabbath, you know, make sure all your work is done and be ready to rest and do no work. You may prepare food, though. Uh, it is also a Kadesh or set apart convocation on po on both days. So worship and fellowship are supposed to be done. And if you don't have fellowship in your area, online fellowship is okay too. Uh, I'm going to do my best to try and provide some videos for those days. Let's talk about sacrifices and offerings. Leviticus 23, 8, but you shall offer an offering made by fire unto Yahuwah seven days, and in the seventh day is a holy assembly. You shall do no servile work therein. So how do we do this these days? 1 Peter 2, 5, ye also as lively stones are built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to Elohim by Yahusha HaMashiach. We ourselves are living sacrifices. When we take up our crosses and crucify ourselves to our flesh, we become living sacrifices that deny the power that the flesh works over the body. And also Hebrews 13, 12 through 16. Wherefore, Yahusha also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered without the gate. Let us go forth, therefore, unto him without the camp, bearing his repro reproach. For here have we no continuing city, but we seek one to come. By him, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to Elohim continually. That is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. But to do good and to communicate, forget not. For which such sacrifices Elohim is well pleased. And now let's talk about the prophecy of Yahusha that is found within the lamb and the unleavened bread. Exodus 12, 3 through 5. Speak ye unto all the assembly of Yashrael, saying, In the tenth day of this month, they shall take to them every man a lamb according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for a house. And if the household be too little for a lamb, let him and his neighbor next unto his house take it according to the number of their souls. Every man according to his eating shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. You shall take it out from the sheep or from the goats. Uh, a lamb of the first year who is without spot or blemish, without spot or blemish, meaning it is perfect. There's nothing wrong with it. First Peter one eighteen through nineteen. For as much as ye know that we are not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversations received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Messiah, as a as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. Uh, John 1, 29. The next day, Yehuchanan sees Yehusha coming unto him and says, Behold, the Lamb of Elohim, which takes away the sin of the world. Isaiah 53, 1 through 7. 
Who has believed our report? And to whom the arm of Yahweh revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, and as a root out of dry ground. He has no form nor comeliness, and when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. As we hid, as we hid at our fate, as we uh, and we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of Elohim, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. And we, like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And Yahweh has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shearers is dumb, so he opened not his mouth. Uh, in First John 3, 5, And ye know that he was manifested to take away our sins, and in him is no sin. There was no blemish uh, found upon him. He was without sin. Exodus twelve forty six, In one house shall it be eaten. You shall not carry forth aught of the flesh abroad out of the house, neither shall ye break a bone thereof. No bones of the lamb are to be broken. Psalms thirty four twenty. He guards all his bones, not one of them is broken. And also John nineteen thirty three through thirty six. But when they came to Yahusha and saw that he was dead already, they broke not his legs, but one of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side, and forthwith came out there blood and water. And he saw and he saw it bore record, and his record is true, and he knows that he says true that ye might believe. For these things were done, that the scripture should be fulfilled. A bone of him shall not be broken. So none of the lamb remains until the morning. <clears throat> Exodus 12.10 And ye shall let nothing of it remain until the morning, and that which remains of it until the morning, ye shall burn it with fire. But why? Why do we burn it with fire? Why can we not keep it till the next day? Luke 24, 1 through 3. Now, on that one uh, on that one Shabbat, very early in the morning, they came to the specular, bringing the spices which they had prepared, and certain others with them. And they found the stone rolled away from the specular, and they entered in, and they found not the body of Yahusha. So, because his body was wholly consumed, so we must either finish the lamb or burn what remains over, what remains left over. All right, now let's talk about eating the flesh and foot washing. Exodus 12, 8 through 9. And they shall eat the flesh in that night, roast with fire and matzah, and with bitter herbs they shall eat it. Eat not of it raw, nor sodden at all with water, but roast with fire, his head with his legs, and the pertinence thereof. And the pertinence is like uh, like the gizzards and stuff. Uh, John six fifty two through 58. The Yahudim therefore strove among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Then Yahushua said unto them, Amen, amen, I say unto you, except ye eat of the flesh of the son of Adam, and drink his blood, ye have no life in you. Whoso eats my flesh, and drinks my blood, has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He that eats my flesh, and drinks my blood, dwells in me, and I in him, as the living Father has sent me, and I live by the Father. So he that eats me, even he shall live by me. That is the bread which came down from heaven, not as your father Others did eat manna and are dead. He that eats of this bread shall live forever. In 1 Corinthians 5, 7 through 8, Purge out therefore the old leaven, that ye may be a new lump, as ye are matzah. For even Mashiach, our Pesach, sacrifice, our Pesach is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the matzah of sincerity and truth. That is Paul. Paul said that. Let us keep the feast. That is him talking to the Corinthians, the people of Corinth. He told him, let's keep the feast, not with the old leaven, the old doctrine that you have been, you know, accustomed to, but with the new leaven or with the new, you know, with the matzah, <coughs> which is Yahusha. So as we eat of the lamb, we realize that we are symbolically partaking of him. The lamb and the unleavened bread are a symbol pointing to our Messiah, Yahusha, a symbol of his flesh. Leviticus 18, 3 through 5. 
after the doings of the land of Mitzrayim, wherein ye dwelt, shall ye not do. And after the doings of the land of Canaan, whether I bring you, shall ye not do. Neither shall ye walk in their ordinances. Ye shall do my judgments and guard my ordinances to walk therein. I am Yahuwah Elohim. Ye shall judge therefore, ye shall guard this. Ye shall therefore guard my statutes and my judgments, which if a man do, he shall live in them. I am Yahuwah. In Ezekiel twenty eleven, And I gave them my statutes and showed them my judgments, which if a man do, he shall even live in them. <coughs> so Yahusha is also represented by the unleavened bread or matzah. John six thirty through 51. They said therefore unto him, <clears throat> what sign show you then that we may see and believe you? And what do you work? Our fathers did eat manna in the desert, as it is written. He gave them the bread of heaven to eat. Then Yahushua said unto them, Amen, amen, I say unto you. Moshe gave you not that bread from heaven, but my father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of Elohim <clears throat> is he that which comes down from heaven and gives life unto the world. And they said unto him, Adonai, evermore give us this bread. And Yahushua said unto them, I am the bread of life, and he that comes to me shall never hunger, and he that believes on me shall never thirst. But I said unto you, that ye have also seen me, and believe not. All that the Father gives me shall come to me, and him that comes to me I will in no wise cast out. For I came down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him that sent me. And that is the Father's will, which has sent me, and that that of all which he has given me, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up again at the last day. <coughs> and this is the will of him that sent me, that every one which sees the Son and believes on him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. The Yahudim then murmured at him, because he said, I am the bread which came down from heaven. And they said, Is this not Yahusha, the son of Yosef, whose father and mother we know? How is it then, he says, I came down from heaven? Yahusha therefore answered and said unto them, Murmur not among yourselves. Oh, I lost my place. Murmur not among yourselves. No man can come to me except the Father which has sent me draw him, and I will raise him up at the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they shall be all taught of Elohim. Every man, therefore, that has heard and has learned of the Father comes unto me. Not that any man has seen the Father, save he which is of Elohim has seen the Father. Amen, amen, I say unto you, he that believes on me has everlasting life. I am the bread of life. Your fathers did eat manna in the wilderness and are dead. This is the bread which comes down from heaven, that if a man eat thereof and die not. And I am the living bread which come down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. During this feast, it is definitely a time to remember Yahusha and what he did for us. And this is expounded at the Last Supper. Luke 22, 7 through 20. And at the beginning of, day, of the daylight hours of the Pesach week, when the Pesach must be killed, he sent Kepha, which is Peter, and Yochanan, which is John, saying, Go and prepare us the Pesach that we may eat. And they said unto him, What? Uh, where will you that we prepare? And he said unto them, Behold, when you are entered into the city, there shall a man meet you, bearing a pitcher of water. Follow him into the house where he enters, and ye shall say unto the good men of the house, The rabbi says unto you, Where is the guest chamber where I shall eat the Pesach with my Talmudim? And he said, And he shall show you a large upper room furnished. There make ready. And they went, and they found as he had said unto them, and they made ready the Pesach. And when the hour was come, he sat down and the twelve apostles with him. And he said unto them, With desire, I have desired to eat the Pesach with you before I suffer. For I say unto you, I will not any more eat thereof until it be fulfilled in the kingdom of Elohim. And he took the cup and he gave thanks. Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I say unto you, I will not drink the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of Elohim shall come. And he took the bread and gave thanks and broke it and gave unto them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this, this do in remembrance of me. Likewise, he took the cup afterwards, saying, This is the cup of the renewed covenant uh, in my blood, which is shed for you. 
So when we eat the unleavened bread, we should call to remembrance Yahusha, just like with the lamb and the wine. And if you're eating with family and friends, break off a piece and pass it around, just like Yahusha did, as we all share a bond through him. And now let's discuss the foot washing, and then we will quickly wrap this up. So John 13, 12 through 17. So after he had washed their feet and had taken his garments and was set down again, he said unto them, Know ye what I have done to you? You call me Rabbi and Yahweh, and ye say, Well, for so I am. If I then, your Yahweh and Rabbi, have washed your feet, ye have also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that ye should do as I have done to you. Amen, amen, I say unto you, the servant is not greater than his Adonai, neither he that is greater, neither he that is sent greater than he that sent him. If you know these things, happy are ye if you do them. So Yahusha was giving an, us an unparalleled lesson on what it means to have the heart of a servant. Even though they called him teacher and they thought of him as being higher than they, he showed them that no man is better than anyone. A servant isn't greater than his master and neither is the son greater than the father. Lastly, let's talk about keeping the feast with unbelieving or unequally yoked spouses. So I cannot speak for Yahuwah, but from personal from a personal standpoint, I do encourage you to just be be a light to them. Don't force anything on them. Don't make them feel bad and just be kind and be patient with them. And most importantly, pray for them. For all you know, this could be a test for both of you. Allow them to come to their own understanding and seriously, don't stop praying for them. All right, that wraps it up, brothers and sisters. Uh, there's no Torah portion this week because I didn't have time to study and put one together. So as Passover gets closer, I will probably be a little less active on Facebook, guys. I want to be able to have time to prepare and get everything together. And I have tons of activities and stuff for my kids that I want to have time to put lessons together for them. So, um, And I will actually leave a link for stuff, you know, if you have children as well, I'll put that in the description below. And let's go ahead and close with a prayer, guys. Yahweh, I thank you for allowing me to share this knowledge. We look forward to your feast with great anticipation. And we look towards what you have promised. And we call to remembrance what you have done, Father. We call to remembrance what your son did for us. For the world, <clears throat> for the world, bleh. I'm sorry. Uh, we should accept him. Yahweh, we thank you for your mercy and your patience. And please continue to guide us in your Ruach and strengthen us in your wisdom and allow us to strengthen and edify one another in spirit. The Ruach HaKadosh. And I pray that your assembly begins uniting soon, Abba. We as brothers and sisters must be coming together in unity, one spirit and one body of one mind. Baruch Yahweh, hallelujah. And in Yahusha's name we pray. Amen. All right, well, it's not Shabbat anymore, so enjoy the rest of your evening, guys, um, and I will let you know about the video on the first fruits. Uh, so, shalom.